everyone and welcome. Dave here is going to talk to us all about Queens and uh, uh, really looking forward to that. So where you go, Dave? Thank you. Great. Well, thank you so much. Um, let's make sure I share my screen here. Everybody can see that. Um, I also want to say, uh, let, let me let me attempt it. Uh, K Mila Salta. Salta. Is that right? No, well, maybe it's not. A F Fulcher. A Fulcher. Sorry, my apologies. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, it's it's great to it's great to be here. I um, was just commenting earlier that I really appreciate the the invite, especially because. I had such a, a wonderful and lovely time at Gormanston, my very first visit to Gormanston uh, last summer. And I would like to think that Gormanston has been canceled because you decided that you were never going to be able to top um, uh, such a meeting. But I, I, I just have a seeking, sneaking suspicion that the, the bloody virus might have a little something to do with it. But nonetheless, um, it's great to, to join you um, and to be facilitated by, by modern technology. Uh, and so it's just, it's really excellent. And I'm, I'm just really pleased that so many of you have decided to, to turn out this evening. And so I'm, I'm looking forward to our, to our discussion here. As I was saying in the chat earlier, um, what I'm gonna be presenting on here is actually a, a version of a presentation that I had provided last, last summer in Gormanston or two summers ago in Gormanston. Um, and it really does, again, focus on, on queens, diagnosing queen problems. And it's really a mixture of both um, research that we've done, that others have done, and, and more practical lessons that can be learned from that. So it's really more of a discussion of, of queen problems. And if you're hoping for some, some hard, hardcore and definitive answers, I'm afraid to, that you'll be disappointed in the sense that it's probably more of a discussion of these questions <laughs> um, and trying to wrap our heads around these, these problems because they're so kind of daunting. And so it's more of a journey and an exploration of questions than it is answers. But hopefully I think by, by exploring that, we'll be able to, uh, to come up with some, some, uh, some takeaways by being able to do that. So um, I don't know how it is in, in Ireland and in Europe and other places, but um, you know, we, we've been having lots of problems with our honeybee colonies with roughly a, a, a 40 percent of them dying off every single year. And surveys in the US at least over the past decade or so has, has identified or at least the beekeepers have self-identified the problems that they're dealing with. Many of them are kind of, um, kind of weather or uh, management related, shall we say, um, you know, just not being weak in the fall, you know, because of Varroa and other things. But consistently in the top uh, problem, you know, 20 to 25 percent of colonies in the U.S. are dying off because of queen problems. Um, now, that's a very kind of catch-all phrase that lots of different things can, can be captured under that umbrella. But uh, suffice to say that um, for, for beekeepers that have been doing it for you know, many decades, there's a lot of anecdotal evidence to really suggest that, um, that queen longevity especially is just not as, as long as it used to be. Queens used to live a longer time than they are right now. And, and actually, I was able to dig up some, some historical data from, from the 1970s and 80s. It was published in the 90s by Zabo, um, where they were able to track a, a very large cohort of queens. And he was able to calculate that the, the average or the median survival of queens was about 25, 26 months. So at least two years was kind of your your typical queen. Um, but we also had some data uh, more recently where we were looking at different cohorts, actually Italian and Russian queens of so different stocks. And we found that they weren't even, their median uh, survival was, was not even a year. 
And so, you know, just within the last few decades, we, we've seen this queen longevity has decreased by a whopping, you know, 58% or so. Queens just aren't living nearly as long as they used to. We don't really know why, and it kind of crept up on us. And it can kind of escape us too, if you're not really vigilant, marking your queens and really, you know, knowing that that, that queen was your original queen. Um, we've also done other studies where just looking at, at, at how good the queens are, in this case, how well mated the queens are, their, their mating number here on the x-axis, and then how long they live. And we find that, yes, indeed, queens that, you know, mate with an adequate number of drones are three times more likely to live um, than those that are inadequately mated. And, you know, again, most of these queens die within the first year. And so it's just simply not, it's a very complicated picture, I guess is what I'm saying. And we know this because uh, the environment in which the queens are living within in the the nests, right, in the in the hives that we have them manage, um, that it's a very complicated environment. And so, you know, there have been other studies that have shown that um, colonies that are having queen problems, right, their early supersedure or um, they're not laying properly or other things, um, they tend to have higher loads, cumulative loads of pesticides in the wax compared to colonies that aren't having such problems. And so there's lots of different factors that are involved in these queen problems. Um, and so if I just kind of try to simplify it and try to answer this kind of unanswerable question, which is reasons why good queens go bad, right? Um, you know, it can break it down to, you know, issues dealing with biological issues like pathogens, you know, viruses or queens being infected, the rearing conditions, you know, these kind of things, the chemical environment, like their pheromones, as well as pesticides, our management practices, the things that we do in our colonies that can affect them, such as, you know, controlling for varroa mites, moving them around, what type of genetic stock we're using, and then environmental factors, um, you know, nutrition, the forage that they're getting from their outside environment, uh, just the intensification, especially of agricultural landscapes. All of these things might go into um, why good queens might go bad. And so to try to break it down and try to, to, to think about it more systematically, um, I'll just kind of go through and we'll, we'll talk about these kind of quote unquote queen events, this kind of catch all phrase of the queens aren't as good as they used to be, but there's lots of different reasons of why queens are going bad or why, you know, it's not just longevity, it's, it's many other things. And so I'll break it down and we'll kind of talk through um, these different reasons of why queens aren't living as long or why they aren't as good. Um, so the first one we'll talk about is just the, the queen herself, right? The queen quality itself um, and what's happened with that over the last several decades. Um, then we'll talk about the brood pattern. That's another way to kind of assess the queen for better or for worse. A third thing is, is premature drone laying. And when queens um, just start laying uh, unfertilized eggs, and then the, the fourth one is premature supersedure and when the, the colonies replace the queens be, kind of before their time, okay? So we'll kind of go through all of, these, all of these different issues because it's my contention that the factors that are involved in each of these things are actually very different. So let's diagnose some of these queen problems. This is, we'll start with the easy examples um, how many of you have done this, right? Where you're hunting around for the queen in your colony and you go frame by frame and you can't find her and you go frame by frame again and you still can't find her. And then you're looking on the side walls to see if she's crawling. And then you have somebody else, you're the helper also go and look. And then after like 20 minutes, you look at the bottom of your boot and there she is, <laughs> right? So that's a known cause of why that queen went bad, right? Like we know that one. 
Um, this is another example here where we actually dissect queens for research. So that's kind of an obvious one. This is an interesting one. This is a, a queen where the, there's a worker stinger <laughs> lodged um, right in her. So we know that the workers did, did her in. Um, so these are all kind of obvious um, reasons of, of why queen quality isn't as good, right? But let's talk about the ones that aren't so obvious to us. And we need to understand a little bit about the developmental biology of the queens because you know, what we see in the colony is either queens or workers. But in, in actuality, the queens and the workers are the ends, they're the, the polar ends of a, of a continuum. So there's actually the ability, the workers, uh, the, the colonies can actually raise all of these inner castes, these things that are in between queens and workers. So if you really think about female honeybees, right? and that they span this continuum of reproductive quality where queens are of high reproductive quality kind of on purpose, because that's what they do. And workers are of low reproductive quality. They're, you know, in all purposes, sterile and, you know, they, they're not supposed to be laying eggs. And so they're the polar ends of this continuum. And so in a normal functioning colony, that's all you see, you see these two ends. But you can actually do this, and we do this for our research, where you can actually rear these inner castes, these, these worker-like queens or these queen-like workers by grafting or by raising a queen from a worker larva that has had one, two, or three days of worker development before they are fed royal jelly and you know started to be raised as a queen. And so you can do this all the way up to a three and a half day old worker larva, um, after which they're just workers and there's nothing that you can do about it. But you can make really, really bad queens on purpose if you want, and that is to graft or to raise queens from older larvae. And so when, when we tell beekeepers, when you wanna raise the best larvae that you can and you're grafting from worker larvae, you want to select the smallest and the youngest worker larvae as possible. So the ones that are so small you can't see them, that's the perfect size. <laughs> because then those larvae will be fed royal jelly from day one and they will develop into perfectly good queens. But if you get larger and larger larvae, as you graft them, then they're going to be more worker-like, and therefore they're not going to be as good. And so we've actually done studies where we've created high-quality queens and low-quality queens, and then placed them into colonies and let them establish and, and grow up over the summer and just see how well they do. And you know, believe it or not, that high-quality queens tend to make higher quality colonies. Um, the queens are larger, they're therefore able to lay more eggs per unit time. And as a result, the colony incrementally grows faster and, and better and stronger over the course of the season. And so it's, it's subtle, but you can still see it that the, queen, the colony is really a reflection of how good the queen is. And so um, it's, it's really therefore important to make sure that you have queens of the highest possible quality and not more as, you know, more worker-like, the lower quality. Um, so in order to do that, again, make sure that they're bigger because bigger tends to be better, uh, that they're grafted from younger larvae, younger worker larvae rather than older worker larvae. Um, and larger queens tend to mate more and better mated queens tend to, to do better as well. So I think that's one piece of practical advice to make sure. Now, it's not, um, it's not a guarantee in the sense that I've seen really small runty queens be bang, you know, just bang it out and just do fantastic. And I've seen really big queens just be kind of lackluster as well. But on average, larger queens make better colonies. Okay. 
So let's talk a little bit about the second point. Um, and this is really oftentimes how we as beekeepers define a good or a bad queen. Um, we, we look at the brood pattern and if the brood pattern isn't good, then we know, or at least we often um, attribute that to it not being a good queen. And, um, and so this is what is known, at least here, I don't know what the terminology is over there, but at least here, the, um, the kind of the jargon that we use is shot brood. Uh, and that's because you take a, a nice frame of brood like this, and it looks like you're just kind of taking a shotgun to it and kind of every other, every other cell or so is empty. Um, and that just doesn't look good. The colony obviously doesn't grow as, as quickly and, and it tends to, to be a laggard. Um, and so it's not so good. And the reason why bad brood patterns such as this is attributed to poor queen quality is because of an interesting trait in their genetics. And it has to actually do with the mating of the queen. So this is why the queen often gets blamed for uh, shot brood or, or bad brood patterns. And it has to do with the way that they determine male versus female. And so not to get too complicated and, and too um, into the, the weeds on the genetic part, but there's a single gene that has lots of different forms or alleles, right? So just like we have a, a gene for eye color. We have lots of different alleles for it, blue, brown, green, whatever. And so in order to be a female, a worker or a queen, um, you have to have two different copies, two different forms of this gene. And so if a queen who has two different forms mates with a drone that has a, a, a third type, then all of the offspring, the worker offspring, are going to develop as normal females, right? But just by chance, sometimes a queen mates with a drone that shares one of her two um, sex alleles that she has. And so half the time when she fertilizes a, an egg, even though it's fertilized, it has two of the same copy and that's what confers maleness. No, no, dis, no difference at this gene. So if you have two different forms, you're a female. If you have one or two of the same form, you're a male. And so this is how you make these diploid drones that you've probably heard or read about. And so when a, a queen happens to mate with a dud that just has this kind of gen, this similarity of genetics, um, then half of her eggs are inviable and therefore she lays shot brood. Now she doesn't know she's doing it. She's fertilizing the eggs. It just happens that there's this kind of genetic problem with the male that she mated with. And therefore it's, it, there's no escaping it. Um, and this is a real problem that leads to shot brood. Now these uh, eggs are cannibalized but the queen doesn't realize it. And so she doesn't go back in and, and fill all those holes. And so that's why you get this bad brood pattern. So this is historically the reason why bad brood pattern equals bad queen, replace the queen and everything will be fine, okay? Now, the problem is that here's a good example of a bad brood pattern. And so if you just look at it, you know, just in a cursory way, you think, okay, well, I'll just replace the queen and all will be fine. Well, not in this case, because if you look really closely, you see perforated cells, maybe some brownish larvae, scale or two. This is a problem with a disease. This is American fowl brood, a really noxious bacterial disease. Replacing the queen isn't gonna do anything. This is a very, very serious problem that calls for a completely different solution, okay? The same thing with this bad brood pattern. Um, this is one where kind of looks similar, but again, you got these brownish larvae, but it's um, before it's capped. You don't see the perforation, no scale. This is European fowl brood, right? So again, bad brood pattern, but a completely different reason. Not a bad queen, but another reason. You can do the same with lots of other brood diseases like chalk brood. In this case, 
This is a really weird one that beekeepers often see, especially in the late summer and fall. Um, this is either parasitic mite syndrome, where you have such an overload of varroa mites that are vectoring these viruses that it's causing problems in the brood and causing a bad brood pattern, or um, what's known as idiopathic brood disease syndrome, <laughs> which just rolls off the tongue, right? Idiopathic brood disease syndrome, or IBDS, which is in essence the same thing, just without high levels of varroa. So you can have parasitic mite syndrome without having a huge number of mites. It just depends on how um, diseased those mites are with these viruses and other, other agents that they're vectoring. So, you know, again, it still ends up with the same thing of a bad brood pattern, but it's not because of the queen. And so we really, really need to be extremely careful. It's really, really rare, in fact, to have a brood pattern that is solely, that have a bad brood pattern that is solely because the queen mated with one bad drone. Most queens mate with a dozen or more drones. And so you rarely get shot brood simply because of her poor mating, right? Most poor brood patterns are because of something else. So we need to be really suspect and really be vigilant and looking and diagnosing brood patterns rather than just kind of quickly attributing it to the queen and, and looking for the first easy fix, okay? Now, we did a study with uh, Marla Spivak's lab, actually her uh, former PhD student, Katie Lee, who's just fantastic. And, and she was working with a lot of uh, large beekeepers in, in the US. And she, uh, whenever she would come across a colony that the beekeeper said, this is a bad queen, because it has a bad brood pattern. Um, she would then sample that queen, sample some workers, sample some wax, uh, and you know, kind of just sample the colony, and then go to the colony right next to them where they had a good queen, sample that queen, sample the wax, sample the, the, the workers. And we tested the queens for their reproductive quality to see you know, if there was a size difference or a mating difference or a disease difference. We looked at the workers for their diseases. We looked at the wax for pesticides, like 200 pesticides that we screened for because we were looking for this kind of single factor, right? Where the, all the bad queens had this disease and all the good queens didn't, or all the, you know, the bad queens were exposed to this pesticide and all the good queens weren't, right? So we're looking for this single smoking gun. And unfortunately, we didn't find one. And in some cases, it was a disease. It was a virus, or at least the bad queens had high levels of a particular virus and the good queens didn't. In another case, the, the colonies that had a bad queen um, had a higher level of one pesticide, but you know the, other, the good colonies didn't. In another case, uh, it seemed to be a sperm viability issue. So there wasn't anything consistent. And so the next year, we're kind of really bummed by that of not finding, you know, like the answer. And so Katie came up with, I think, a really brilliant uh, alternative way of testing this. And so the next year, when she found a good and a bad queen based on their brood patterns, she simply swapped them. She introduced the quote unquote bad queen with a bad brood pattern and put it into a colony with a good brood pattern and then took the, the good queen with the good brood pattern and put them in the bad colony, one with the bad brood pattern. And so if it really was because of the queen, then after three weeks after this swap, then the brood pattern in the bad colony should have improved and it should have a good brood pattern now. And the one in the um headed by the bad queen, that should then go downhill. And that isn't really what we found. <laughs> um, we found that um, there was, uh, to a certain extent, that the queen was driving it. But in the end, it was really the environment, the colony environment, so that the good queen placed in the bad environment 
looked worse. And then the bad queen placed in the good environment looked better. So really, we are attributing the brood pattern to the queen when it's really a, a collective you know, measurement, right? And if you think about it, who's raising the brood? It's the workers, it's not the queen. She's just laying the eggs. So if there's a, a problem with the brood pattern, then there's a, a, it has a lot more to do with the nurse bees and, and the workers and the nest environment than it is really the queen. So, you know, these bad queens are not always of low quality um, and it's not always attributable to the queen. So we really need to kind of change our thinking again about the brood pattern being just the sign of the queen. You know, the queen is really more reflective of the colony than it is really her fault. All right, so let's talk a little bit now about um, kind of premature drone laying and um, you know, a, a totally different symptom, a totally different problem than a bad brood pattern. Well, it is a bad brood pattern, but it's a bad brood pattern in a different way. Um, so here's a bad brood pattern or bad queen laying pattern um, that is attributable to, well, I guess it's attributable to the queen in a certain way. Um, but here you have these telltale signs of multiple eggs per cell. They're not all laid on the bottom. What you get is this is a, a great um, quintessential example of laying workers, right? So the queen is gone and she's been gone for like a week or more. And the workers start developing their eggs and start laying eggs. Um, so this is, this is a queen problem in the sense that there's no queen. And it's actually really, really hard to rescue this. <laughs> Once the workers kind of get a taste for power, it's hard to kind of give it back or get it back. Um, but in the end, um, you know, this is a problem in the sense that there is no queen and hopefully you don't get to this point. But when you talk about drone laying, you can see things like this, where here it's kind of in the center of the brood nest, right? And, um, you see rather than the, the flush cappings of workers, you see a lot of these are domed up and are actually drones because they don't fit in there. So they actually are larger and so they stick out a lot more. So if you see a lot of drones in the area of the brood nest where the workers ought to be, that starts to be a bad sign. And in this case, you have a drone layer where um, you know, there's no sperm. If you see every single cell that is not flush, but instead is domed up, that suggests that she has no sperm, that she was never inseminated on her mating flights. Um, and therefore, the spermatheca, this organ in her, in her abdomen that she uses to fertilize the eggs, that's totally empty. It's totally clear. If you dissect her open, that spermatheca is totally clear rather than filled with sperm like this one here on the right. This is different, I would argue, than a symptom like this, where you see, in essence, the same thing in the drone comb or in the brood comb, where you see a lot of these raised domed cells where the workers should be, but it's really um, drones. This is where the queen has either run out of sperm or the sperm is dead. Now, how is you as a beekeeper able to tell the difference, right? So here you can have a spermatheca that's totally full, but if it's full of dead sperm, dead sperm don't fertilize eggs. So you can have the same problem of having a drone laying queen, but it, you know, how, that, how you arrived at that can be totally different. So the first one where there's no sperm in the spermatheca, this happens when you have very young queens, right? Those that um, you raise yourself or that you've just recently purchased and you install them into a colony. And if they're laying nothing but drones, then she just never made it. Uh, and so that's a different problem than this where it's an old queen, right? She's been living for a season or hopefully two 
but eventually she starts to run out of sperm or at least live sperm. And so she can't fertilize those eggs anymore. And so a lot of them start to become drones. So if you have a young queen, it's probably a mating problem. If it's an older queen, it's probably that she's just kind of running out of, of stored sperm. It's also possible that you can have kind of a middle-aged queen or youngish queen that has been exposed to pesticides or to temperature fluctuations that kills the sperm in the spermatheca. So she's, she was full with sperm, but then the sperm die, she can't keep them alive. And now she's starting to lay nothing but, but drone, unfertilized and therefore drone eggs. So um, all of these things uh, need to be taken into account when you're trying to, to dry, diagnose a drone laying queen. Now, what's interesting is that we've, we've started doing some studies on this uh, because we've been piqued by some anecdotal observations that we have. So we, we work a lot with beekeepers in the US where uh, they can send us queens and we can analyze them uh, and tell them how good their queens um, are, or at least how good they should be based on kind of a standard measuring uh, process that we have. And so one year we actually intentionally asked beekeepers for drone layers because we wanted to do some studies on, on drones. And so they sent us a whole bunch of drone layers. And of those, 40% um, of them did indeed lay nothing but drones. So that was what we were looking for. But interestingly, 20% of them, they started laying drones, but then after about a week, they recovered and they started laying workers again. And then another 40% of them, even though the beekeeper said these were drone layers, they sent them to us, we put them into our colonies and they laid beautiful, work, normal worker brood. So our thinking now is that this whole idea of drone laying that I was talking about before, there may actually be instances upwards of 60% <laughs> where the drone laying is a condition that can be reversible. Maybe it has something to do with the environment. Maybe if they're laying in a, in a, in a nest that has um, contaminated wax, for example, maybe something happens and you know, only, only the, the drones emerge or something, but you put them in a, in a different environment and they can, lay, uh, they can fertilize the eggs again. Or maybe there's some sort of infection of the queens and there's a, a physical blockage where she can't release the sperm from the spermatheca, but just by putting them in a cage and shipping them um, and, then, and then reinstalling them, they're able to clear that infection or that blockage and then they're able to, to lay fertilized eggs again. We don't really know, so we're looking into that, but just the whole idea that drone layers may not be this kind of fatal permanent condition, I think is, is quite interesting. And so we're, we're trying to look into how common this is and then ways that, that you as a beekeeper might be able to um, put them in a, in a different situation that gives them an opportunity to, uh, to recoup and to recover that condition. So, but again, that's not always the case. Old queens, eventually they're gonna run out of, of viable sperm and therefore even the best queens at some point are going to become drone layers. All right, so uh, the last um, kind of bucket of problems that beekeepers can have is premature supersedure. Now this is really distinct from a lot of these other things because um, all of these other things, at least the queen is, is, is in some way a party to this, right? The, the queen quality itself, clearly just within the purview of the queen. The brood pattern and the drone laying, you know, that has to do with both the queens and the workers. Premature superseder is entirely based on the workers. The queens don't want to get superseded, even if they deserve to, right? <laughs> 
Um, but it really comes down to kind of this worker collective decision of, you know, we just don't want her anymore and we want a new queen. And so, you know, if you read some of the books are certainly online, you'll see a lot of the adages of, you know, swarm cells being um, on the periphery of the brood nest, whereas supersedure cells being in the middle. Um, that is, I think, to be taken with a, a grain of salt um, that is not diagnostic by, by any means, but um, you'll often see that. The reason is because swarm cells, supposedly the queens lay the eggs in those cells. And so the cups are often on the periphery or on the under underside of the, of the combs. Whereas supersedure cells, we don't really know how those are reared, but if they, if they do it like emergency queen rearing where they take a worker larva and then just start feeding it royal jelly and then, and then transform the comb so that the cell is then pointing downwards, that often can happen in the, in the middle of the, of the brood nest rather than on the periphery. But in general, we don't really know, so don't, don't use it as a diagnostic. But regardless, you know, the, in, the, in the springtime, this is when you have um, a lot of uh, swarming going on, right? And so you have queen replacement because the old queen has left. And so they're developing new daughter queens kind of on purpose. Now I'm sure that most of you here, you've never had your colonies swarm at all, but your neighbors, you know, they, their colonies can swarm. And so this is what can happen to them. Supersedure, however, often happens in the autumn um, after a season of, you know, of egg laying by the queen. So, Let's talk a little bit about queen problems and queen replacement when they're quote unquote supposed to during swarming. And so we see a lot of queen problems where the, the beekeepers are saying they replaced my queen um, and I don't have a queen anymore. Well, what actually happened is the colony swarmed and you just didn't even realize it. <laughs> So if you, if you look through this, the stages of the old queen leaving and then them developing the daughter queens and then the, the victorious queen from that kind of battle royale of those daughters, she has to develop, take mating flights, mate with drones, gear up her reproductive machinery and then start laying eggs. So this can take weeks. So it can take up to six weeks or so for that whole process to manifest. So if you come along, if you're not checking your colonies every week, you can miss an event like this. The mother queen is already gone in the swarm. And so you can come back and if you see queen cells, well, then you know that she just left, right? But if you come back two or even three weeks later, you can see there's no open brood, maybe some residual sealed brood from the old mother queen. But the old, the new queen isn't going to start, isn't going to mate and start laying eggs until about, you know, five to six weeks, you're gonna start seeing brood again. So if you miss a swarm and the colony replaces the queen um, as a result of the swarm and you come in a month later, and there's no open brood, there's no sealed brood, there's maybe some uh, emerged queen cells, right? You're way too late to do anything. There's a virgin in there that's undergoing the mating process. And, um, you know, you just need to be patient and let, you know, let things, uh, let things play out, right? But this is why, especially in the spring, you need to check your colonies um, every, every seven to 10 days. I fear that I might be frozen. Brennan, can you hear me okay? Yeah, I can hear you, no problem. Okay. Everything's right. Working fine. I think my mouse has frozen up. I think it's gonna catch up here in a second. But anyway, so, I, so um, this is something that we see a lot in, uh, in beekeepers because they're, they're only checking their colonies, to, you know, they're not checking their colonies frequently enough. And so they have one of these queen events and they think it's a supersedure where really it's actually a swarm. So you need to understand kind of the developmental process 
of when the old queen leaves versus when the new queen comes online. Um, and so you need to be very uh, patient and let that go through. If you catch it early enough, you can you know, prevent the, the virgin queens from emerging and then replace that, the, the queen uh, with one of your, of your own. And that will um, save you about four to six weeks of diminished productivity of the colony and they'll do a lot better. So here are just some examples of what I was talking about before. Sorry, my mouse isn't working now. Um, this right here is a queen cell, again, it's kind of on the bottom. And actually, if you look really, really closely, you can see that um, this is just about to emerge. This is probably a, um, uh, a, a mature, fully mature virgin queen that is about to emerge because you can see that she's already cutting a slit in the capping. And in fact, workers can feed the queen through that, through that slit and then seal it back up. Um, and so, you know, that's a situation where, you know, you, you have hours, let alone days, not even days to do something about it. Um, this is just another example of many, many queen cells within, within the nest. Here's an example of uh, queen rearing where something happened with the larva where the larva actually falls out from the, the royal jelly in the top of the cap. And she kind of keeps tumbling down and the workers keep elongating the cell. If anybody's ever gone in and seen a queen cell that's like, you know, four inches long <laughs> and, you know, it just seems really, really odd and weird. That's the reason why um, is because the, the queen the, the larva actually fell down and, and obviously she's not gonna fully develop correctly. This is an example here of where it's pretty much too late for you to do anything, okay? So reading the cells and reading the frames. So here you have a queen cell that has emerged because she cut the capping off perfectly on the bottom and she came out. But then she went and she found her sister rivals before they emerged. And what the queens do is they chew a hole through the side of the cell and then they sting the occupant. And then the workers come along and realize that that developing virgin queen is now dead because it was assassinated by her sister. And then they tear down the side and chew, chew the rest of the cell out, but the capping stays intact, right? So if you ever see something like that, then you know that there's a virgin on the loose. A virgin queen is going around killing all her sisters if she hasn't already done so, so that she can take over and go on her mating flights. At this point, there's no reason to put a new mated queen in there because the workers are gonna accept that virgin over any queen, pretty much any queen that you put in there. Um, and trying to find a virgin queen is really, really hard because they look and they're shaped like queens, but they're about the size of a worker because their abdomens aren't activated with their ovaries yet, so they're a lot smaller. So it can be really, really hard to find a virgin queen. At this point, it's almost better to just let them, just shut them up, leave them alone, let the queen go off on her mating flights, come back, and start laying eggs. So if you come back 10 days later and you see eggs being laid, then you know it's okay. Just some example, some more examples of those assassinated cells. This is one where they chewed the hole in the side and then they pulled out the kind of the dead underdeveloped virgin queen right there. If you have a virgin queen and she's mated, but she's, not quite yet laying. It takes, you know, two, three, four days for her to cease mating, but then to start egg laying. A good sign that she's about to start laying eggs, the workers somehow know this, probably pheromonal, and they start clearing out the, the brood nest. So all of the brood from the, from the previous mother queen is hatched out, right? So it's all, it's all gone but they will polish all of that empty brood nest and clear it all out and just to get it ready. It is totally ready for this new queen to come online. 
And so once she does, she will just go crazy laying eggs because um, she just has wide open spaces in order to do so. So if you see something like this, where they actually kind of clean it up, clear it up, polish it up with propolis and everything else, and then just kind of leave it alone, that's a really, really good indication that you have a new, new mated queen about to start laying. So other things just to look for when it comes to kind of queen replacement during swarming, um, again, you know, just be on the lookout for all stages of the brood. Look for a uh, capped and open brood. Um, bees that are queenless, you know, they have a, a buzz to them. Now they're not more defensive. This is, in, this is interesting. Queenless bees and laying workers are not actually more defensive, but they sound like they are. <laughs> um, they have a buzz to them. They're often Nazanoving and they're often looking for kind of a, a missing queen, right? So just uh, listen to that. And they can be loud and runny where they're just kind of, they're more skittish than normal. Um, some people say that if you don't have a, a queen in the colony and there's no larvae to feed, they stop quitting, they stop po uh, gathering pollen. That's actually not true. Colonies will just continue to, you know, pollen foragers will be pollen foragers and they'll just keep um, uh, gathering pollen and foraging for pollen no matter what. But then again, what to do if you kind of miss the boat and you miss the, the, the swarm or the supersedure event, just be patient because again, it can take many, many weeks. An ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. But if you, if you unfortunately miss, miss an event like this, um, and you don't catch it in time, then just be patient and, and let uh, nature take care of itself. When in doubt, if you really don't know what's going on, sometimes it can be good to, to go into another colony and take a frame of eggs and, and young larvae, open brood, and place that in the middle of the brood nest. Um, and that will allow the, the bees to kind of get by, give the nurse bees something to raise, if, they're, if they really are truly queenless, it'll give them something to raise new queens from. But oftentimes it's not, they won't raise queens from that, from that frame. Um, and that'll give you an indication that you have a virgin or a newly mated queen in your, in your column. Now, I should say that again, I'll, I'll go back to this study uh, with Juliana Rangel um, when she was in our lab of looking at high and low quality queens as they kind of grow up over, over the course of the summer and that high quality queens kind of make better colonies. Um, we should note that low quality queens were not superseded more. So one of the hopes of this study was that we were going to make such bad queens that the workers were gonna reject them. We we're gonna put them in the colonies and, the, and the, the, the bees would be like, this queen is trash, we need to get a new one and they'd supersede her. But they wouldn't, or they didn't. Or I should say that they did so just as often with high quality queens and they did with low quality queens. So we don't really know why. So it's not that low quality queens are superseded, high quality queens are kept. It's more complicated than that. So there's, there's something else that's going into this worker decision-making of getting rid of an old queen. And so if you will entertain me with this kind of ornate and, and overly complicated kind of thought experiment, but hopefully you'll be able to follow my thinking here. And that is, if we look at the life of the queen, we can break down the life of the queen into, into three stages. Now they're not all the same uh, duration by any means, but we can look at, at the effects and the impacts of the environment and the colonies at these different stages. So if we look at the development stage, right? So the development stage is the rearing, right? And then as they emerge and then they mate and then they start laying eggs, right? So that's about three weeks, you know, uh, four or five weeks in the, in the early stages, right? But then once the queen starts laying eggs, we have what I call the establishment phase, which is where she starts laying eggs, 
and it ends once the entire population has turned over and is now her offspring, right? When she first starts laying eggs, it's like all her sisters, right? But then all of her worker sisters eventually die off and eventually they're her daughters, right? So that's the establishment phase. Now the interface between those two phases is where we can move queens, ship queens, transport them, introduce them from one colony to another, right? So we as beekeepers do a lot during that kind of interface, okay? But once the population is turned over and it's all, um, it's all the daughters of that queen, then we have the survival phase. This is you know, where the queen has, has finally been accepted and we want this to last you know, three to five years or however long you know, queens are supposed to live. This is what we as beekeepers want to maximize the survival phase, okay? But even so, eventually, even the best and longest lived queen eventually is going to go downhill. And so this is the fourth and final phase, which is the replacement phase. So at some point, the colony is going to say, the queen's had a good run, but we need to make a new one. And at that point, they will requeen her, they will supersede and replace her, and then the process starts all over again. Okay, you with me? All right, so if we look at the quality of the queen, and let's just look at the, the proportion of the sperm in her spermatheca, just as, a, as one example of this, right? So when she's a virgin, it's empty, but then when she mates, it's full. And then when she starts laying eggs, she starts using the sperm from the spermatheca. Um, and, that, and so that goes down over time, right? Now, as we've shown, you know, the viability in the spermatheca is not necessarily always 100%. In fact, it's usually more like, you know, 80 to 90%. And so um, really the viable sperm, not the total sperm, you know, goes down over time. But regardless, she uses up her sperm supply, right? And so if you think about the workers having some sort of perception of the queen, where they have this gestalt idea of the queen where she's acceptable, but at some point she might fall below some threshold where they deem her unacceptable. And once she falls below that threshold, that's when they decide to get rid of her, okay? And so it's like us with, with democratic elections, right? Um, we have a binary choice in our system where you either keep the, the, the incumbent or you throw the bums out, right? Like we don't have an intermediate point and neither do the workers here, so they have you know, some sort of complicated decision-making process that is collective, right? It's not just all up to one worker, it's up to all of them. And, and so they, they must have some way of having an opinion of the queen. And so it's at, at you know, some point she's acceptable, but at some point in her life, she falls below that threshold and she's now unacceptable and they wanna get rid of her, all right? So this perception, that's what this line is, this perception over a course of her life is high, 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 high. And then it hits this threshold at some point, now she's unacceptable and they supersede her. The problem that I, as I see it is that this normal perception curve, whatever it is, has been shunted backwards into the survival phase where something is accelerating this collective decision or this, this general opinion of the queen by the workers so that she crosses this threshold earlier and earlier, or even in many cases during the establishment phase. So even within the first couple months of her laying eggs and before she even turns over the population, something is causing their perception to fall below that threshold and want to get rid of her. So this is where a lot of our research is now headed, where we're trying to look at all of these different phases and all of these different facets and inputs into the, the colony environment that might 
affect the worker's perception of the queen. And needless to say, this is very complicated. And so trying to tease all of this apart is going to be pretty hard. But you know, I think at each phase, different inputs may be a factor. Um, whereas, you know, the the inputs into the establishment phase may very well be different than the inputs during the, the survival phase, for example. And so this is kind of how we're thinking about it, where it's more of this kind of collective democratic decision that the queen's fallen below a threshold. If we can figure out what goes into that decision making, then maybe we might be able to reverse this trend so that the the queens aren't replaced as early as they have been in recent years. But to summarize, you know, and again, having more questions than answers here, we know that all of these different factors go into, you know, what makes a good queen good and what makes them bad. And, you know, we, we tend to just blame the queen a lot more than we ought to. Um, if we look at all of these different things, yeah, some of the problems are indeed a queen problem, but most of them are actually part of the colony or maybe just the interface between the queen and the colony. And so really it's more about the environment in which the queen is in rather than the queen herself. So we really need to be thinking more collectively about the, the colony environment rather than the queen. The queen is very easy to replace, but oftentimes that's, that's just um, a symptom and not a cause of some of these problems. And so with that, I would be happy to uh, entertain any questions or um, thoughts that you might have. Let me pull open the, uh, the chat window. And the, a lot of the questions from the Q and A. Uh, do we want to uh, just ask them live, or do you want me to read them out uh, from the chat? Yeah, well, from the the Q and A rather than the chat. There's a whole bunch of them in the Q and A. Oh, okay, I didn't see the Q and A. Let me. Oh, there's the Q and A. Okay. All right. Excellent. Okay. Well, let let me uh, just start at the top here. Is there any evidence whether queens are accompanied on their mating flights by bees from her hive? That's a fantastic question. Um, I, I don't think so, but never say never. Um, they are, the workers, however, are involved in ushering the queens out from the hive. And I've seen a lot of variation in this too. So there are some queens that are very ardent and just want to go on their mating flights and they just run out the front and boom, they're off. There are others that are, that are so reluctant <laughs> that they're literally dragged by the workers and kind of, you know, thrown out. So it's, you know, kind of like the, um, you know, the, 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 um, parents forcing their kids to go to the prom, you know, it's like, I don't want to go to the prom. No, you have to go to the prom, you know, that kind of thing. Um, so there's variation in the Queens on that, but I don't know why, uh, but I don't think they actually accompany them on the flight. So they're not, they, they might be chaperones. They're not chaperones, but they're um, facilitators, I guess. Good question. Um, couldn't the decrease in longevity, whoops uh be related to artificial selection produced by beekeepers continuously replacing their queens annually <laughs> very true very possible or at least decreasing the evolutionary benefits of, of natural longevity um absolutely so that is something uh, we could be passively selecting for queens that don't live as long um it has been argued by some that at least here, especially in commercial operations that we have here in the US that I don't think is nearly as prominent or as kind of industrialized as it is over uh, on the continent, um, that uh, we're, the, we're asking the queens to really burn the candle at both ends, right? There's no off season for queens. And we're also keeping them in hives that are way bigger than what you would find them in nature, right? One standard Langstroth bee box is about the 
the median or average size of a natural honeybee cavity. You know, but we then stack two or three of those on top of each other and then five or six honey supers. And so colonies are kind of bigger and more productive uh, than they really should be. Um, so that is certainly possible that we've been selecting for queens that can handle that kind of physiological load, perhaps at the expense of their longevity. So that's certainly possible, but I think beekeepers have been pushing their bees, you know, pretty hard for longer than that, certainly um, back in the 80s when they seemed to be living longer. So that, while that may be a component, I don't think it's the only answer, but it's that kind of passive selection is a very interesting thing that I think is definitely a viable um, factor in, in all of this. Great, great point. Uh, if a poor queen, uh, quality queen is superseded, will the queen produce be poor quality too? That's a great question. That's something I've always wanted to look into, but we haven't yet. It would be actually quite simple to do so. Um, what to, to rephrase that in kind of a kind of a biological terms is that is there maternal effects of of a queen on her offspring? So everything that I've talked about so far is that the quality of the queen is really contingent upon her rearing environment, her diet, royal jelly diet during development. So you can make poor quality queens by not feeding them royal jelly the entire development time. Um, but if a poor quality queen then has a higher likelihood of having poor quality daughters, then that's either genetic or there's something from her of the mother's environment that is then heritable to her daughters, which would be really, really interesting. But, um, and again, never say never, but I don't think so. I think the overwhelming effect here is not a maternal effect, but rather the, the environmental effect of how well they're raised. So you can take, you can probably raise really high quality queens from low quality queens. I'll stop sharing here in case that makes things a little easier. Um, what would the temperature fluctuations which result in a drone laying queen? So I need to add that actually to, um, to this presentation because we have a postdoc in the lab. She's actually in uh, Vancouver, Canada is where she's based out of. But she's been doing, a, um, her name is uh, Allie McAfee. She's been doing a lot of really fantastic work on the physiology and the proteomics of queens and temperature and sperm viability. And so uh, in essence, at least here in the US, I don't know how, how it's, it's done over there, uh, but you know, a lot of beekeepers start up colonies with packages, um, which I know you have over there, but um, I don't know how common it is. And so you know, if you overheat, if a, if a package gets overheated, a package or a queen in the package gets overheated, all the bees die, right? And so obviously that's not good. So during shipping, they tend to overcompensate and they tend to really make sure that they're well ventilated and really cool because we know that bees can cluster and just and stay warm, right? Um, well, what her work uh, and Jeff Pettis and, and some others uh, that we're collaborating with has really shown that if you overheat, you know, not to the point where the bees die off, but you overheat the queen, you can kill off the sperm. But if you chill the queen too much, She's not gonna die, but it might kill the sperm in the spermatheca. And so she can become a drone layer or she can become you know, premature drone layer. She can lay good eggs for a while, but then start laying drones after a few, a few months or, or weeks. And so the temperature range is actually a lot less. Um, you wanna keep it between uh, room temperature and hive temperature. Uh, in Fahrenheit, that's about you know seventy degrees to um, to ninety degrees. Uh, I kind of forget what that is. Is that thirty to thirty five in Celsius? Does that sound about right? Um, so you know when I see beekeepers, you know they have a battery box of queens that they're requeening their their colonies, and they're they're wearing a winter jacket, <laughs> and there's snow on the ground and you know, there's a battery box of queens on, on the top on the lid of a hive. That's really not good. 
Um, and so handling queens, I think, is really, really important. And we need to be a lot more gentle with them and make sure that the, the temperature range is, um, is not too extreme. That's a great question, though. Uh, what kind and type and size of microscope do you suggest for beekeepers for nosema? Um, so, you, so nosema is actually one disease that queens can get. Uh, they, they can't get AFB, they can't get um, uh, varroa, you know, some of these other things, but they can get viruses and they can certainly get nosema. Um, and so nosema, you're going to need a, um, a binocular compound microscope that can go down preferably to 400X. And so, uh, and then you're gonna need a hemocytometer, ideally. Um, you don't have to, but that certainly helps for the counts of the, of the nosema. And then you dissect out the guts of the queen or the workers that are in the environment um, that are kind of feeding the queen and might infect the queen with nosema. Um, so you can kind of grind up the guts and, and put it in drops of water and put it under the microscope and, and look for the nosema. I'm, I'm giving a very, very brief overview of that. But there's some very good uh, broken down step-by-step -step instructions on how to do that. But I think the, the microscope has to go down to 400X and it's better to have a binocular with two, two um, uh, um, rather, rather than just have a, 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 single, a single vision because it helps to have the, uh, the um, stereoscopic vision for that. Um, how much do I think the various varroamite treatments have an effect on queens and their performance? Um, undoubtedly they do at, at a certain point. Um, I, I'm not gonna list all of them. They haven't been all thoroughly tested actually for the effects on queens. And again, does it have a direct effect on the queen or does it affect the workers and their potential perception of the queen? <laughs> Um, and therefore, if they, their perception of the queen fall below that threshold and then they blame the queen. I'll give an example. Um, formic acid or even oxalic acid are two organic acids that are approved over here. Um, but uh, they have certain temperature ranges where they work better. Oxalic is supposed to be used during a broodless period. Um, but formic acid, uh, it can be used during the active season. Um, but both can burn brood. Both can, um, because it turned, they turned the, the hive into a fumigation chamber. Um, it can be toxic. It's supposed to be, you know, toxic enough to kill the mites, but not toxic enough to kill the bees. But the larvae are very fragile. And so it can burn the larvae. And so you can apply one of these mite treatments and in essence kind of gets rid of all of the young brood within your colony. Brood pheromone is a secondary fecundity signal of the queen. And we think that it actually might be fairly important for the workers to have this positive opinion of the queen. If she's laying well, then there must be a lot of brood smell within the colony and the brood pheromones is something that can be really important. And so if all of a sudden there's no brood in the colony, well, the queen must not be laying well. There must be something wrong with her. Maybe that, that kind of gestalt perception of the queen goes down. So, so that's where it can be complicated. It might not affect the queen at all. Uh, you know, formic acid, you'd probably have to have a very, very high dose in order to kill the sperm in the queen spermatheca, but it might have a secondary effect on the worker's perception of her and you can still have queen problems. Does that make sense? So I do think that these are things that need to be investigated, but more holistically. Up till now, a lot of the pesticides and acaricides and mite treatments that have been tested on queens, if at all, have been kind of topical applications onto the queen. And then they look at her and like, do they live? Does she lay different? Nope, okay, that's fine. I think it might be um, more complicated than that. So um, jury's still out on those. Uh, what are the main factors involved in queen balling? 
what triggers this biologically? Oh, this is a favorite subject of mine. I actually did my master's thesis on, on, on some of this in some ways. There's actually many different forms of balling, queen balling. Typically what, I mean, if you wanna see queen balling, take a mated queen and throw her into a queen right colony. The workers will immediately notif uh, recognize that she is foreign and they will ball her and sting her to death and pitch her out of the colony, right? But they will, they will form this ball of uh, dozens, maybe a hundred or, or more workers around that queen just because they, they just can't stand the smell of her, right? They just, she, she's just obviously a threat and just, you know, not good. But there are other types of balling that you can see in colonies. Um, that one is kind of this foreign invasion type response. That's what triggers it. Um, but I studied and described this other form of balling that occurs during um, swarming and specifically during the fights of queens, of virgin queens. So the mother queen swarms, the daughter queens are left behind in the original colony. They emerge and they start going through this fights, right? Where they're literally fighting each other to the death. And one, one fighting tactic that virgin queens use is they will actually um, expel hind gut contents on each other. Um, they will throw feces at each other, <laughs> laden with some sort of pheromone. We have some idea of what that might be. But the reaction is totally different. The, like, so you get these two virgin queens that are walking past each other, and they will kind of shoot their hind gut contents at each other, like two, two broad ships, you know, passing each other. And if one of the queens gets hit and the other one doesn't, the one that gets hit and gets tagged with this pheromone, the workers are so highly attractive to it that you get thousands of bees balling that queen. And it will persist for hours sometimes. And what happens is that other virgin queen who did not get hit, she will tunnel her way into this ball, find this immobilized rival and stinger because she's a sitting duck. So you have this kind of protective ball or they're using this balling behavior where the workers aren't trying to kill that queen. They're, tr they're so highly attractive to whatever was sprayed um, that the queens are using it as a fighting tactic to hire like, or to, to get the, the workers on their side to do their bidding. Isn't that fantastic? So. I think normally the, the balling is what I'm saying, just kind of the nestmate recognition thing that goes on, but there are other forms of balling. Of course, then you have that, the protective balling the, um, of predators, right? Of the murder hornets, or at least that's what we're calling them here in the US. It's the, the giant Asian hornets um, where over in Japan, where they try to invade and then they will ball the, the hornet and they will, you know, um, heat their, their motor muscle, their wing muscles, like they do during winter to heat, heat up, but they will actually cook the, the hornet to death in a, in a way to protect the hive, killing themselves in doing so. Um, but it's a way to kind of ball an intruder. So there's many different forms of, of balling, which I've always found very, very interesting. Anyway, um, Commercial queen producers cage queens two weeks on average from when they introduce a queen cell. That's true. It ranges from uh, 17 or 18 days to 21 to 22 um, usually. That's the cycle that a lot of them go on. Is it true that they have best queen quality? Uh, they should be allowed to lay uninterrupted for three weeks. And can I explain why? I can answer that. I can't explain why. But there have been, there was a study or two out of uh, New Zealand, I believe, where they um, allowed the queens to lay in the mating nukes before putting them in a cage and shipping them off. And they found 
a markedly better improvement in acceptance and overall queen quality when they did that. So I don't know quite know why that is, but that's the study that you're referring to. Um, and I think a lot of the commercial queen producers know of this, but in essence, that would, you know, double or triple the amount of equipment and mating yards and everything else that they have. And so it's, I think needs to be followed up and documented that if it is worth, you know, um, if, if beekeepers would pay twice the price for a queen like that, then probably there'd be a market for that, right? But I think there needs to be um, more study to understand those dynamics and why that is, and that it's consistent enough that it's worthwhile to make that kind of investment. If you're doing it yourself, if you're raising your own queens, then definitely, definitely um, allow the queen to, to lay in the nuke in which she was mated for a good brood cycle before you move her somewhere else. That's probably good, good advice. Uh, do I think that the decision to supersede a queen by workers is evidence of bees sentience? And that is a collective decision. I think, I think bees are sentient in the way that they make, um, uh, I mean, they behave and they uh, make decisions and they uh, are, are certainly collectively making very intelligent decisions, right? Read Tom Seeley's books. And um, this is very analogous actually to a lot of his work where they, he was looking at the collective decision of which new nest site to move into, right? And why, like how, like how is that collective decision made? I would love to be able to apply that same type of process uh, and thorough understanding of that decision over the decision to replace the queens. But I think any given worker, and this is, this is true in the, in the collective decision-making process of, of house hunting, no one worker has a total understanding of what's going on. They're not comparison shopping, right? They're not going from one nest site to the other and then making a rational decision. They're following other simple rules that if they all abide by them, then they're able to make a quote unquote, very intelligent and smart decision at the group level. But at the individual level, they have very, very little information. So it's, it's a wonderful example of how they don't have to have huge brains and be really smart in order to collectively make intelligent decisions. Is there any data to suggest that a queen is more at risk of being replaced shortly in a newly settled swarm? That's a good question. Um, all I can say, I, I can't say that is more at risk. That's, that's what's tripping me up with that question. I can say that we've done several studies and anecdotally we've seen this too, that anywhere from 20 to 25% of newly installed packages, the queens get replaced within that establishment period, within the first nine weeks. Um, is that more or less at risk than, um, than in other phases? I'm not really sure. I, I, would, I would say maybe that's a very, very high number. And again, we don't know kind of what's going into that collective decision, but it certainly is true. Now, more at risk being replaced in a newly settled swarm. So you mean a natural swarm. I don't think that test has, has been done. It'd be interesting to do that though, um, to see if a, the old mother queen, right, in a settled swarm has a better chance of being hived up than, uh, than a package or something like that. Yeah, so I don't, I don't know of any data that suggests that. Do queens um, that are artificially mated last longer than open mated queens? So Sue Kobe and I have a long running debate on all of this. She's published a paper and she steadfastly maintains that um, instrumentally inseminated queens are just as good as far as their mating and other quality, longevity, everything else than uh, open mated queens. 
I just say that she's kind of the world's expert and she just does such a good job that the rest of us that can't be as good as her, <laughs> our, our II queens don't last as long. Of course, in, in my experience, I'm using instrumental insemination to do things like inseminate a queen with only one drone, which they would never do in an open mating flight, right? So, um, so those queens obviously don't last nearly as long as an open mated queen. Um, so I think that's the, the argument is there. I think if it's done right, the reason why instrumental versus artificial insemination is more apt is because, you know, what in some ways, what really matters is whether or not the spermatheca is full. Ideally, if all else is the same, the thing that really predicts the queen longevity is when she runs out of sperm. Right. If everything else is the same, the environments are ideal and everything else, the only the only thing that will, you know, prevent a queen from living forever is that eventually she's going to run out of sperm. So if you can inseminate or instrumentally a queen so that she has uh, five to seven or more million sperm in the spermatheca, that's as much as she can hold. Um, and so open mated or ii it, it it shouldn't matter but again that's all else being equal which is i think uh, a real weasel uh <laughs> a real way for me to to to, to um, not be able to give a definitive answer on that um, is the longevity of the queen influenced by rearing in uh, apidase or nukes as opposed to full hive i would love to test that um, I think my, my guess is, is that there's going to be some sort of critical mass or a critical population of a colony that will optimize uh, above which it wouldn't matter. So you can probably get too small. In fact, um, here's a Voika back in the 60s did some, some nice studies where he used instrumental inseminated queens, but at least um, did them in different sized nukes. And he found that the, the amount of sperm that went into the spermatheca was more if they had um, larger colonies, that is, I think, what, what you would consider an apidae, but not like 300 workers. That's not enough for the queen to be able to store enough sperm somehow. So there's something about the interaction between the workers and the queens that actually facilitates her sperm uptake. <laughs> and so there's probably some minimum size, but I don't know if that's ever been done really, really granularly and precisely. And I would love to, to, to do an experiment like that, or at least to, to see what something like that done. I think um, the, you, the, the downside of having a larger hive, like we don't want to have our mating nukes be, you know, too deep, you know, hives, because that's a lot of bees and a lot of equipment and everything else to raise a single queen, right? So there, there, there's, I'm sure, a balance between what's convenient for us as a beekeeper and what's uh, biologically necessary for the bees. But it, it's probably, I think, I'd like to say the proof is always in the pudding that if you're, you know, making queens and having really good success in a, in a particular operation, then, then that's really all that matters. Are drones implicated in any way apart from the quality of their sperm and the example in passing pathogens? Yes, um, we have a postdoc in the lab right now who got his PhD actually over in Denmark in uh, per Krager's lab, uh, uh, um, Eshmael Emery. Uh, Amiri, sorry. Um, he his PhD thesis really definitively showed that some of these honeybee viruses can be sexually transmitted diseases. So you can have um, uninfected queens mating with infected drones. The queens then become infected, and then she can infect her offspring through the eggs as she's laying eggs. So um, that has been shown. It's hard to kind of prevent it. I think that pathway of drones to queens pales in comparison to the pathway 
of varroa mites vectoring these viruses horizontally among workers in the colonies. And then of course, the workers can give the queens the viruses through feeding and, and, and other pathways. So I think um, all things considered, that's uh, probably not a major pathway for these viruses, but it certainly does exist. Um, my bees are in an orchard and I naturally let them swarm. That's cool. Uh, when using uh, the vapor oxalic acid treatment, I found that when swarming, the queen was found dead when hiving the swarm. Um, yeah, I don't have a whole lot of experience with uh, oxalic. Again, it's really best used in queenless situations. And here in North Carolina, we really don't have a queenless period, or at least if, if it is, it's very, very short and it's very, um, uh, you know, it's not always uh, guaranteed. And so I think um, I don't have a whole lot of experience with that, but I, I like uh, to hear those kind of things because as I was saying before, oxalic acid and some of these other things might be affecting queens more indirectly. And, you know, we think of these things as being toxicological to the queen. And so we want to expose the queens to these things and see what happens to them but it actually might be more indirect where it might be affecting the workers' perceptions of the queens or something else happening that way. So looking at it from that perspective. Uh, I've already commented on artificial inseminated queens. Um, should we be allowing more drone production to increase genetic variation? Um, I think so, although I think we as beekeepers already do a pretty good job at that. Um, at least nowadays, I don't really see it as popular as it used to be a generation or two ago of people intentionally cutting out their drone comb and um, having those drone traps on the entrances. So as the drones fly out, they go up into cages and then you kill them all uh, because all they do is eat food and they don't do any work. That used to be the mindset of beekeepers, but I don't really see that um, being done much anymore. And so I think it's, um, you know, it doesn't, doesn't seem to really be affecting the queen's matings, at, at least from, you know, what we can tell, at least here in the US. But the genetic variation is an interesting point because that also depends on at which level you're talking about. Um, you know, a queen that mates with 12 drones, that all the drones are from a different hive is very different from a queen mating with 12 brother drones, right? So the genetic diversity within the colony is going to be limited if she mates with all brother drones versus um, unrelated drones. And so um, you can get inbreeding and you can get other problems if you don't have sufficient intra-colony genetic diversity. But at the kind of greater population level, the genetic diversity, even given the bottlenecks that, you know, that we have, especially here in the US where they've all been introduced, um, it still seems to be sufficiently high where it doesn't um, seem to be posing a problem. But in general, um, increasing that genetic diversity can uh, is usually a good thing, but I don't think we need to be kind of proactive or make it a, a huge priority. That's just my my guess. My one, my young queen took uh, six and a half weeks to lay. My goodness, uh, and my old queen six weeks to lay after putting her into an, <laughs> a a nuke. That's that's an interesting thing. So yeah, the six and a half week time period. Um, of, you know, the swarm or, you know, the old queen leaving, whichever mechanism that is, and then, you know, raising the queens, having them duke it out, the successor queen, you know, that can take many weeks. The successor queen um, getting mature enough to go on mating flights. So she only takes mating flights about um, day four to seven. What if it's rainy during that period of time? I heard sometimes in Ireland it rains. Uh, so, you know, that can keep them bound, bound up, you know, queens need to be very, very, they have to have perfect weather really only in the afternoons in order to take their mating flights. So if it rains every afternoon for a week straight, that's going to, that's going to prolong her mating. 
Um, and so, yeah, it can sometimes take that long. Hopefully, hopefully not all the time. Hopefully that's more of a, of a um, outlier than a norm. Are there pathogens that are uh, transmitted vertically? Yeah, so it's mostly those viruses that I was talking about. So if a queen is infected with viruses, when she lays the egg, the, 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 and this is again, something that Eshmael has, has studied in recent years, the egg is, the viruses are not inside the egg. It's actually on the outside of the egg because he, looked, he measured viruses of the eggs, found viruses, and then he washed off eggs and measured them and he didn't find viruses. So it's probably transmitted when she's laying eggs, it's on the outside of the eggs. And so that's how the, the offspring, you know, can be getting it. But they're of course, um, you know, transmitted much more horizontally in, in many different ways. And so I think both the vertical and the horizontal transmission are important. Um, and it's, it's really hard to, to deter both at the same time. Uh, so somebody heard that Jeff Pettis is saying that he has a, a hypothesis that queens not living as long as in the past due to beekeepers selecting colonies that are gentle, calmer, and less swarmy. Could this be contributing to a colony that is less defensive, or less, resulting in queens that are less robust, uh, robust? Yes, Jeff and I are very close collaborators on a lot of this work. We're co-advisors of Ali McAfee that I was referring to before. Doing, he's been doing a lot of this stuff on, on temperature and sperm viability and other things. And so, yeah, we've talked about this quite a bit. And so, um, and again, it's, it's just a hypothesis at this point, but we certainly have been selecting for colonies that can grow bigger and bigger and bigger without swarming, right? That's what we want. Um, bigger and bigger colonies, naturally they should swarm, but we don't want them to. So we're passively selecting against that that could very well be selecting for um, queens that are not producing enough queen mandibular pheromone or other queen signals, or the worker's responsiveness to it is less, or both. So um, one thing that uh, anecdotally Jeff and I have noticed is that if you go to certain places in the world where apiculture is certainly not as intensive, um, you will notice that the queen retinue, the queen court, right? The queen in the middle and the workers are all surrounding her and licking and grooming her. It is amazing how strong those retinues are compared to a lot of what we see when we do observation hive work or when we measure retinues. So it's very possible that there is some sort of signaling either from the signaler or the receiver that might be affected by this and therefore have some of the perception you know, of this gestalt idea of how good the queen is. And so this fits right into that entire conceptual framework that I have, that if the, the workers were passively selecting workers to have low opinions of queens in the first place, so it doesn't take them much to go below that threshold, then maybe that is what's going on. So yeah, I would like to, to look into something like that. And I agree that there's a lot of possibility there, but there's no um, uh, empirical evidence of that as of yet, that I know of. Uh, I note that queens sometimes stop laying for a period coming up uh, to or after the honey harvest. Later in the autumn, I note that these hives start to get busy with pollen coming in. Could a hive decide to stop laying to interrupt varroa buildup? I don't know if, I certainly don't think that that's intentional for Varroa necessarily because it's such a newly introduced parasite. Um, you know, I, I'm not sure if they're doing it, but, but bees and especially bees of different stocks certainly do respond differently to the environmental cues, right? Um, Italians are really broody and they'll just keep brood rearing. Whereas Carniolans, they'll really shut down their brood rearing if, if there isn't much of a pollen or nectar flow. Um, and so I think that kind of natural variation might be in sync with some of that stuff. But I don't think they're doing it in response to Varroa per se, but it might have a positive effect on Varroa um, in that way. But yeah, I think those are kind of queen and colony level traits that might be of interest in trying to suss some of this stuff out, not just kind of the queen longevity issue, but 
but also, you know, Varroa and just overall management issues. You know, maybe we should be looking at that kind of trait and and actively selecting for that rather than just ignoring it. Uh, do I think a proportion of the problem with queens being superseded becoming drone layers and running out of sperm early is due to the fact that most beekeepers treat drones as sacrificial resource for Varroa uh, and to control Varroa. So I'm assuming you're talking about drone brood trapping in that way. Uh, beekeepers don't give the bees anywhere to raise the amount of drones they would in a natural setting. Maybe, maybe not. Um, I think you're probably right on that, that we give them frames that don't have drone size comb most of the time, you're correct. Um, and so they, yeah, the workers fill the foundation, um, uh, the drone brood and whatnot. So I think you're right. So I think I'm a big fan of the drone brood trapping for Varroa um, because it's non-chemical and it can really knock the mites down very effectively and has a lot of other problems. The downside is kind of was discussed before is that you're now depleting the local drone population to mate with queens. And we are often mating a lot of queens in our research and otherwise. Uh, so I actually had a master's student many years ago um, who, who looked into ways of having it both ways. <laughs> so in essence, she used the technique of drone brood trapping of having all of the mites go to the drones rather than the workers. And rather than taking that frame before all the drones and the next generation of mites emerge and throwing it in the freezer, killing off all the mites, but then killing off all the drones as well. In essence, what she did is she, she took those frames, took them out before they emerged, but instead of throwing them in the freezer, she threw them in an incubator and had them emerge in an incubator. And then in essence, took the drones and did a big sugar shake on them to knock all the mites off and then threw the drones back in the colony. The benefit of that is that you, you keep the drones, but the other thing too is that the drones that are most susceptible to the mites, that is carrying bad genes for mite susceptibility, are not gonna fly and mate and pass on those, those genes. Whereas the ones that were parasitized but were hardy regardless, they are. And so it's, it's not only a good way to keep the drone population up, but it can be a good way to possibly passively select for some mite tolerance as well. Um, and so all you need is a $10,000 incubator and emerge your drone frames in there every single year and then do a sugar shake on them. Um, if you don't have a $10,000 incubator in order to do that, she tried a second technique which was um, where she had sets of five colonies. Um, four of them, she did the drone trapping and then just simply took those frames out from those colonies and that was the only mite control that they got. But the fifth colony um, is where she put all of those uh, drone frames. And so all of the drones emerged in this one colony and they were just overloaded with drones. But then she, um, she controlled the mites with a, a um, formic acid, I believe it was, or maybe it was uh, one of the thymol products, but she controlled, you know, using a, a, a biopesticide in that one colony and the other four were, were needed no other control. So um, there are different ways that you might be able to have your cake and eat it too. It just takes a heck of a lot of work to do that. That's a, that's a great point and a great questions. Just tell me when to shut up, Brandon. I'm uh, happy to keep going. Love talking about this stuff. And these are fantastic oh, questions, everybody. So I was, I was more worried that you'd be, be exhausted by them, but if you're happy to answer, I'm, no, I'm, I'm, I'll, have, keep, going until, well, I'll keep going until my, uh, my voice gives out. I'll, I'll be fine. <laughs> um, the queen seems to be blamed with most of the ills of the colony. Um, and so to what extent is she to blame for sac brood and chalk brood? So again, you're, you're exactly right. And thank you for picking up my major point, which is the environment of the colony. You know, if there's something wrong with the environment, well, the only thing we can do about it is to get rid of the queen, right? So that can, that can often be the case. And again, that gestalt idea of, of the workers. And so how does sac brood and, and chalk brood, which are kind of lesser, um, I'm not gonna, I shouldn't say lesser, 
they're not as noxious brood diseases as some of the others. And they're often associated with stress diseases that the bees can overcome on their own more than some of the others. But again, if brood pheromone or some of these other things impact their perception of the queen, then maybe those brood diseases can also contribute to their perception of her. It hasn't been shown, again, this is all just a, a hypothesis and just an idea that I'm um, uh, just kind of exploring, but I think uh, it's possible, but it would have to be a pretty severe one, right, in order to see the queens getting the full blame of it. Um, but again, uh, more evidence is needed for that. Uh, if the queen is old in years but continues to lay good uh, brood, should she be allowed to stay or should she be replaced after a fixed number of years? Um, yeah, I, that's beekeeper choice. I think a lot of beekeepers proactively replace all queens, especially in larger operations here in the US. They just replace their queens, good or bad, no matter how good or bad they're doing, because they know at some point they're going to go downhill and it's a lot easier to just do them all at once rather than, you know, one at a time. Um, but I think, again, proof is in the pudding. If you have a long lived queen and she's doing really, really well, then, you know, just keep an eye on her, <laughs> but let her keep doing her thing. I have seen, however, I've, I've seen, um, I've, I've had a couple instances now where I've had beekeepers claim that they have, you know, like a six year old queen or something like that. And they know because she's marked which is what we should all do. And that's a great way to keep track of the queen. And um, I've gone into those colonies and you know, you go and you find the marked queen. You're like, hey, wow, she's doing really great for being six years old. But then you stop looking for a queen. I would challenge you to keep looking for a queen because very often, not very often, there was a study in Germany. It says about 6% of the time you can see an old mother queen in the same brood nest as a daughter queen. And so they can be laying in the same brood nest or the old queen is just still there, but the new queen is the one doing all the laying. <laughs> so um, I think it can be difficult to suss that out a lot of times. But again, in the end, if she's still doing well, go ahead and keep her if you want to. I don't think there should be a kind of retirement plan, a fixed retirement plan on, on, on queens. Uh, recent mating research in the UK seems to suggest that virgin flies, uh, virgins fly up to five miles, whereas drones are able to fly about two miles. So the chance of virgin, with, a virgin mating with her uh, brothers is unlikely. That's exactly right. That's what, um, at least anecdotally, people have thought for a really long time that research in the UK has really been fantastic um, and, and giving a lot of insights into that. Um, and so, you know, again, I, I think when it comes to beekeeping, there, you know, the exceptions are the rules. Like it's really hard to, to say queens always fly five miles. But I think in general, queens do tend to fly further than the drones. Um, again, to avoid that inbreeding, because again, mating with your brothers brings in that sex allele mismatch that causes shot brood. Um, so they, they go to great lengths to make sure that they're not going to be mating with their, with their drones. Mating with 12 or more drones is another way to make sure that you don't mate with your one drone that's a brother. So that's another reason why they mate so many times, just to make sure that they're not mating with brothers, uh, but their behavioral differences are, are another way to do that. Do virgins normally duke it out between themselves or do they let uh, keep the workers keep them apart and just neglect the virgins they don't like? Um, I've collected mated queens in a jar and they um, just have a little tea party together. Mated queens in a jar, yes. Virgin queens, no. Uh, virgin queens, so, you know, if you look at ants or other social insect species, the workers are the ones that kill off, if, you know, if they only have one queen, but they raise a dozen, the workers are the ones that kill off the other 11. 
In honeybees, that doesn't seem to be the case. And I've watched hundreds, if not thousands of hours of virgin queens fighting each other, a process that can, can take hours and hours, sometimes more than a day um, in, in an observation hive. And the workers don't kill the queens. They can get involved in that spraying behavior that I was talking about before. So they, and they chase the queens, they harass them. It looks like they're, they don't like them, but they're, they're not killing them. I, I think it might be, they're putting the queens through the gauntlet or something, you know, to kind of only the strongest will survive or something. But in the end, it's the queens that kill each other, not the workers. The workers might, you know, discard a, a, a loser of a fight, you know, and kind of, you know, throw them out of the cell or throw them out of the hive, but they themselves will actually not kill um, the virgin queens. But you can, um, you can take mated queens that have lost this tendency, this kind of bloodthirst for killing each other. Once they've mated, then they're all chill. Um, and uh, there's actually been studies, we've, we've done some replicates of this as well, where we have been able to make polygynous queens, that is colonies that have 12 or more queens in them laying old mated laying queens that are all laying in the same brood nest. Um, they just lose that desire to kill each other once they get to a, a certain age, um, which is really, really interesting. Um, and so, you know, this is, uh, I think it depends on, on the status of the queen. Uh, thymol has been shown to dro uh, reduce drone fertility, correct? The dose makes the poison, of course. Um, and so, you know, uh, uh, I think at hive realistic levels, uh, it can have an effect. The drone fertility is different from the queen fertility. That is the stored sperm in a mated queen versus a, you know, unmated drone. Um, I think different stages can have an effect on that as well. We've been doing a lot of work on the, um, kind of the reproductive ontogeny of drones. And so they actually, you know, and we've known this that, you know, drones don't really reach sexual maturity until about two weeks. Um, and so we've shown that, but they're still born with all the sperm that they're ever going to have in their testes. It just doesn't descend down into the seminal vesicles until they're a little bit more mature. And so, you know, I think it'll be interesting to, to look at um, the, the ways that, that thymol and other, and other mite control products might be affecting reproductives um, either directly or indirectly. Um, is it that workers can hold back later virgins in their cells until the early ones have left? So yes, if a colony is, in, uh, is, is large enough to issue after swarms, that is swarms after the prime swarm is left with the mother, if it's big enough to, to produce secondary swarms headed by virgin queens, either one or multiple queens in those after swarms, then the workers actually get a lot more involved. The, the queen duels last a lot longer. They will actually imprison queens in their cells. The queens will start to chew themselves out and the workers will actually butt their heads up against the cells and then reseal the cell so the queen can't get out. <laughs> um, they're, they're trying to regulate the process so that the colony can maximize how many swarms it issues. Once all after swarms are done and they can't make any more after swarms, then they just let all queens kind of emerge and duke it out and whoever wins, wins. <laughs> um, so the, the workers don't actively kill the queens, but they are very much involved in the kind of decision-making of the colony during those reproductive events. It's really fascinating. Um, how do you identify black queen cell virus in its early stage and how do you resolve it? I said I'd answer questions, not hard ones. Um, I, it, unfortunately, the best way, that, and the only way that I know of to identify black queen cell virus is to wait to see the black gooey mess of the dead larva and pupa. 
That's the best way. Um, how to do it in the early stages, I don't know. Um, we, we don't really know a whole lot about that. It's very problematic for queen rearing. Um, I, I would assume that what you can do is screen the colonies to see if the workers have the black queen cell virus and then not use that as a cell builder. <laughs> but that's expensive, time consuming, not very practical. And at this point, we still don't really know how those larvae get infected, presumably through the nurse bees feeding them royal jelly that has virus particles in it. But there's also an association of black queen cell virus in Nosema. And that was done back in the 60s by Bailey and Ball and, and a bunch of other folks at Rothamsted in, in the UK. And, um, but that was with Nosema apis, right? We have Nosema serrana now um, that is the predominant uh, Nosema species. And we don't know if there's a similar association there. So um, I, don't, I don't have any good answers for that, I'm afraid. Um, I, I wish I did because we can have black queen cell problems in our queen rearing operation as well. So I think I got to the end of the list. Is that correct? Um, I've exhausted all of you. Yes, indeed. Uh, Thank you very uh, much. <laughs> that was an enormous amount of work. Thank you. Well, uh, it's really, really great. Those questions, all of them, fantastic. Sorry if I missed a few um, and didn't get to some. But I know it's late uh, over there in the evening for you guys. And so I, I bid you a good evening. And, and thanks again for, for having me. OK, thank you. And uh, thank you, everybody, for uh, coming along. Right,